we ask to pray to the of the occasion of the anniversary of the late October 6th revolution. The first point that I think uh, why we are observing this anniversary and we need to observe this anniversary is because of the tremendous impact that this revolution has had on the course of direction of human history and human civilization in advance. It irreversibly changed the manner in which human civilization advanced, and that was its very big impact that continues to remain there even today. But it was also a great inspiration for toiling people all over the world, in our own country, from Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore to our national poet Subramanya Bhartiya, Ram Kamila, to all to all these people, the October Revolution was a source of inspiration. And why was it a source of inspiration? And why it remains a source of inspiration? That we must realize when we observe the anniversary of the October Revolution. The first reason why it was a source of inspiration is that October Revolution is the only only event in the course of human history, from ancient times to the modern, that succeeded in freeing the people of the whole society from exploitation and the oppression. It was not only the revolution of the working class, it was not only the revolution of the overthrow of capitalism and creation of a new system of socialism, where there was equality and where there was equality both of the production of the society and of opportunity for the people. But it also freed oppression of various other sections of the society other than the working class. It was the beginning of the establishment of a free society. That a free society is possible. That a society where exploitation of man by man cannot be there is possible. That remains the fundamental source of inspiration of the October Revolution even today. The second reason, which remains valid today, as it was valid then, is the fact that it demonstrated that a society where there is equality and freedom, a free society of human beings, is a society that is much superior to capitalism in the sense that what took capitalism 300 years of development to achieve the levels of human the civilization. In 30 years, socialism achieved those levels. In 1930, Ravindranath Tagore visited the then Soviet Union. And there is a small book which is called The Letters from Russia. And in those letters he describes that but for the fact that he came to the Soviet Union and saw for himself, he would not have believed that within a period of 10 to 15 years, the socialist revolution has abolished unemployment, has abolished poverty, and has ensured that all children are in school and are being educated. He said this has not happened even today under capitalism. But socialism has shown that this is possible and it is that superiority of the system that finally made Soviet Union challenge the imperialist powers of the world and emerge as the counterweight power to the domination of US imperialism in the world and it became its direct challenge to US imperialism. That superiority of the system of socialism continues to remain the second basic attraction. That is why, because of the strength of socialism, when the world was threatened by fascism and Hitler and Nazi fascism of global domination, when the Second World War was unleashed, it was the strength and the sacrifice of the people of the Soviet Union that played the biggest role in the defeat of Hitler, in the defeat of fascism, and for the liberation of the world from fascism. Remember, 
when Hitler was defeated, it was not the American flag, it was not the French flag, it is not the flag of the United Kingdom, but it was the red flag of the Soviet Union that flew on the top of the right side, announcing to the world that Hitler was defeated. That was the power of socialism, that it could affect the liberation of the human, human beings, the human civilization and the human race. And the fourth important reason why this needs to be observed every year is for the contribution that socialism and the socialist revolution and the Soviet Union made for the liberation and independence of all, all colonial countries in the world, including India. Socialism was the biggest inspiration and Soviet Union was the biggest inspiration for all the leaders of India's struggle for independence. Whether it was Jawaharlal Nehru, whether Subhash Chandra Bose, whether it was the revolutionaries, whether it was Sikhar Bhairi Chakya from the Milan, whether it was the fact that the first May Day in India was observed on the Marina Beach by Sikhar Bhairi Chakya in Madras for the first time in the whole of India. This inspiration for the working people to organize to liberate themselves from exploitation came from the October Revolution and Soviet Union. And it is that support that allowed the independent countries to become truly independent. India and its strength, economic strength, could never have been built but for the selfless aid provided by the Soviet Union in building our infrastructure, our steel plants, our economic infrastructure, in all that the Soviet Union played a role not only for us in India but for all the its colonial countries who gave freedom. So this is continues to remain as an example of human civilization that here in the country, born out of the October Revolution, which was selflessly to help the rest of humanity to advance and move towards the liberation. And this is the fourth reason why it continues to be relevant for all of us to observe the October Revolution and Soviet Union. That is why today, when we observe the October Revolution's anniversary, many people today ask us the question that Soviet Union is no longer in West. The product of the October Revolution is no longer alive. Why are you observing the revolution? Soviet Union and socialism in Russia has collapsed. So that October Revolution has failed. No, the October Revolution has failed not because Socialism, there is something wrong with the ideal of socialism. October Revolution failed not because there is something wrong with Marxism, Leninism that created science that led to the revolution. October Revolution failed because of the mistakes committed in the process of socialist construction over the period of 70 years. And those mistakes, the CPI, Communist Party of India, Marxism, had realized in this city of uh, Madras then in 1992 and we came to the conclusion that it is neither the negation of Marxism Leninism nor the negation of the socialist ideology but socialism's demise in the Soviet Union was because of the mistakes that were committed in the process of socialist construction and those mistakes we identified in four four specific areas but those are details I am not going into now. But today, when you say Soviet Union doesn't exist, but what is it that we learn from the October Revolution relevant for us today in India, in today's condition? There are at least four aspects of the experience of the October Revolution that are important and relevant for us today in our struggle in current India for a, creating a better India and for liberating the Indian people from exploitation. The first of these is that the Soviet Union and the Russian the October Revolution could not have succeeded but for its steadfast opposition and struggle against imperialism. It was Lenin during the post before the October Revolution who identified the development in capitalism leading to the state of imperialism and how imperialism seeks the global domination.
No revolution can succeed unless it can challenge imperialism and challenge to liberate their country from the stranglehold of imperialism. Anti-imperialism remains and continues to remain today a very important factor for us also in our struggles in India for our own liberation. And therefore, this particular lesson from the October Revolution is very relevant for us in today's country. Why is it important for us? Today, what this Modi government is doing to India and to the people, for that, it is getting the entire support of global imperialism, particularly in the United States of America. India has today become a strategic junior partner of US imperialism. And today, in the global affairs, India is seen as imperialism's junior partner. The struggle against this Modi government and its policies and what miseries it is imposing against us cannot be separated from the struggles against imperialism because imperialism is a background of support for this Modi God. That is why in these last four years he has been to the USA five times and he, every time when he goes there some new deal is made when India becomes more of a subservient partner. And this linking the struggle against Modi government and the struggle against imperialism are part of the same struggle must be understood from the fact that the Modi government ever since it assumed office has taken economic policy measures that only facilitate greater profit maximization of foreign capital from India and to help the Indian domestic corporate capital to make more profits at the expense of the Indian people. So this factor, which results now in 73% of India's GDP going into the hands of 1% of India's population. 73% of our country's wealth is now in the hands of 1% of the population. It was 49% of GDP in one person when Manmohan Singh was Prime Minister, we were criticizing and struggling there. In four years, he has increased it from 49 to 73. And by doing that, he has given massive profit of life, privatized all public sector units, allowed foreign capital in all areas of the Indian economy, and allowing the loot of our country's resources and of our people by foreign capital in India. So struggling with Modi government policy and imperialism are intertwined and that is the first lesson that the October Revolution taught us when they succeeded in that revolution. It is told that is why our Prime Minister is fond of travelling abroad. He goes to all the countries in the world and I believe there are only about 20 or 20 odd countries left where he is not been. So before the general election maybe he will cover all those also. And when he is in India also, he is in the aeroplane most of the time. Uh, he is visiting one place or the other. So, but today he is, uh, he is supposed to be in Mali, where he is supposed to have met Mahindra Rajapaksa. The Supreme Court has held it as unconstitutional the dissolution of the Religious Domestic Government. And uh, the Parliament has today. They have not accepted Mahindra Rajapakshay by majority of the MPs as the Prime Minister. There is a constitutional crisis. But that constitutionally unconstitutional act that, that Prime Minister, is, uh, Mr. Modi, has met in Mali. His fondness for travel is such that while he wants to elicit support from all over the world and, and deepen the relationship with imperialism, so that what he is doing to the Indian people he gets the support of imperialism. Imperialism is happy because they are getting more opportunities to make greater profits from India. That is why the parliament was when I was there. One day we saw, I keep telling this story, suddenly the Prime Minister coming uh, in the Lok Sabha, he sat down, there is a seat for the Prime Minister, sat down for the seat, he was fumbling. He was very uncomfortable. Now, in the parliament, for Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha, there is a common place where you have television, internal television channels, where we can see what is happening in both the houses. 
So when we saw the Prime Minister very uncomfortable, so we asked some uh, Lok Sabha MPs, what happened? Why is the Prime Minister so un uncomfortable? He seems to be really disturbed. So one uh, Rajya Sabha, I mean, one Lok Sabha MP said, Sir, if you don't give, tell me my name, I'll tell you the truth. I said, I won't tell your name, but you tell me what happened. So he said that the Prime Minister came to the Lok Sabha, he sat down in his seat and he was searching for the seat belt, but he couldn't find it. Because he was traveling in the plane so much that as soon as he sits down, he wants the seat belt. So he could not find it, so he was a little uncomfortable. So that is the level, level of jokes that, that are going on. But all this is not a political objective. Objective is dovetail India to global imperialism and its uh, globalization process. And thereby increase misery in a hot army. If that has to be fought, imperialism has to be fought. Without fighting imperialism, the fight against Modi government and its policies cannot succeed. The second important point as for, uh, for the October revolution that is relevant for my report. It was Lenin leading the October revolution who said Russia is a backward country. To achieve the socialist revolution in Russia, and one stroke immediately is not possible. Russia has to go through a certain degree of development before we can move towards socialism. And for that, on that basis, let it put forward the thesis of stages of revolution. In India today, given our backwardness, not only economical but also social, Given our problems in terms of our diversity and social exploitation and oppression, given our caste and oppression, given our oppression on our rivals and the other sections, the unity of our people has to be developed through the development of our economy and by liberating our people from the stranglehold of feudalism and the feudal order. Even though big landlordism doesn't exist in the way it used to exist in the past, but the consciousness of feudalism, domination of caste, domination of religion, this consciousness continues to divide the people. More than dividing the people, it has got the potential to be used by our class enemies to divide the people, like Modi is doing today. Misusing religious sentiments of the people, he pits one religious group with, against the other, the Hindus versus the Muslims. And what should he say? What? My God is better than your God. The Hindus telling the Muslims or the Muslim fundamentalists telling the Hindus. By this we create the tension whereby people do not unite in the struggle for the common issues which is exploitation because of the economic policies and the misery that follows. So dividing people through social tension, because the democratic stage of the revolution has not been completed, the impact of feudalism and landlordism has not been eliminated from our country, this situation continues which is exploited by the reactionary uh, section like Modi and the BJP and the others today. So therefore in India, if we have to move towards the socialist revolution, a socialist revolution ending all exploitation. The state of the working class of India. If that has to be achieved, first we have to remove the stranglehold of imperialism that we discussed earlier and of feudalism and the consciousness connected with feudalism. To complete both these tasks, it is necessary to remove the current ruling classes in India that is the bourgeois and lower classes from state power who are not allowing these tasks to be completed. That is the democratic stage of the Indian Revolution. Where we need allies. We need allies that will be brought together in this stage to achieve the anti imperialist anti feudalist anti-monopoly capital tasks. That concept of a democratic revolution before the socialist revolution that is the product of the October Revolution. And that is an issue without which Indian revolution cannot advance. 
and that is why today we are fighting against uh, this current government. While the current government policies and etc. on that we will fight and we shall remove this government. That is the effort that is going on today. New allies are coming. We will all together try to work it out. But the larger issue is the issue of eliminating the struggle over the feudalism and imperialism on our country and that can be achieved only when these sort of governments, the Modi government, do not control the reins of power in our country. The democratic revolution and therefore the, and after that the socialist revolution, this is the contribution of the October revolution that has got direct validity for us in India, for our revolutionary advance. The third important factor which has a very direct in India of from the October Revolution is what the October Revolution put forward the, the concept of the worker present alive. Let it was clear, the revolution could never have been succeeded but for the unity that was built in struggles between the working class and the peasantry, including the agricultural labor in Russia then, which we call the rural proletariat. Only when all of them joined together and moved them forward in the revolutionary struggle did the revolution succeed. Today in Indian condition, the work of present alliance is of crucial importance in our struggle today, not only to unseat this Modi government, but also to achieve the creation of a better India where this sort of economic exploitation will end and what we promised in the Indian constitution of equality of opportunity, equality of opportunity and equality, social, economic and political for every Indian can be achieved. In order to do that, this struggles of the world of present and united that will have to be still. It has a direct relevance for us today, not only to advance towards our revolutionary objective, but also for the immediate objective of unseating this government and reversing these policies which are imposing this misery in our people. And that is why today, what we saw in last month in September 5th in Delhi, for the first time, the working class, the peasantry, the agricultural labor organization, they all came together in a big march to the parliament and that was the beginning of the creation and the establishment of this work of peasantry. And this work of present alive that is growing, today you have big struggles led by the CPI, led by the All India Kisan Sabha, led by the CIGU, which are moving towards a long march of the peasantry from all parts of India that will culminate in Delhi between the 28th and 30th of this month, November. And on the 8th and 9th of January, you will have the All India Industrial Strike called by all the central trade unions minus the RSS affiliated trade unions, the BMS. So you fight these movements that are going on. These are all that come directly from the inspiration of the October Revolution of the need to strengthen the work of present alive. That is the third important thing in today's world. So this work of present alive that we are trying to build like the zero seven double one roadblock on the land. the is a roadblock that comes to how we want to build the work of the land. And and that, that roadblock is what Modi and the RSS we did here. So we have to clear the road if you want to proceed forward in the work of the land. And that is what is what do they do? We are seeking the unity of the working class, the peasantry and the agricultural labor in the struggles for improvement of their own livelihood and for reversing these policies that are intensified exploiting. And what do the government forces do? They seek to divide that very union by whipping up communal polarization. That is the road problem. They whip up communal polarization by any issue that they can find. First is Hindu, uh, Hindu Muslim and whip up the hatred, whip up the violence. It's either cow protection, it's either moral policy. They will tell our children what they should wear, which clothes, how clothes, what sort of clothes they should wear. 
what food they should eat, who are the people whom we can make friends and whom we they cannot. And if they their intercaste marriage, then they are the cup panchayats that murder both the boy and the girl. If they if they don't listen to their moral punishment and they go ahead if, and with their friends, then they are attacked in the name of love vihar or in some other name. So the whole point is to create this atmosphere of gay violence and poison the mind of the people in order not to allow them to unite in these struggles against the existing politics. That is the danger of communism. It is not only an issue of whether brown people in Ayodhya, whether women should be allowed in Sabrimala. So that is the basic objective, not one issue of temple in Ayodhya, not one issue of Sabrimala, whether women should be allowed to enter or not. Any issue on which people can be divided, that will be picked up by them. Take Sabrimala, take the double speak of the, 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 of the RSM village, on triple talaq issue connected with the Islamic religious law. CPI has always said that triple talaq, that instantaneous arbitrary manner in which it's implemented is wrong and that should be corrected. A law may be necessary to correct it. But on triple talaq, the Prime Minister himself showed a lot of uh, excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. And he said, no, the BJP is for giving equality to the Muslim woman. Because the Indian constitution gives equality to women. So Triple Talaq was being discussed with the parliament. We said in the parliament, send it to a uh, select committee to examine the, examine the bill properly. That is the parliamentary procedure. Mr. Modi was so impatient that he did not wait for that. He issued his ordinance. So Tibur Talaq ban was issued through an ordinance. Why? In the name of providing equality for Muslim women. Very good. Today, Supreme Court has said women will be allowed in Sabarimala if they want to go. Those who don't want to go, they won't go. But if anybody wants to go, they are allowed in Sabarimala because equality for women, that is there in our constitution. That they are opposing to. Equality for Muslim women on Tribal Talaq is correct. But equality for Hindu women in Sabarimala is wrong. So now very strange, RS and BJP is becoming a pro-Muslim party and an anti-Hindu woman party. So because because they are not giving that equality to Hindu women. But it is not a question of any principle. It's a question of what is the rod we can get to create a division. Divide the people. And to do that division, they want to disrupt the unity we want to see, to change the present state of affairs and to put alternative policies for a better livelihood for the Indian people and to end this exploitation and oppression. And that is why this struggle for it, strengthening the work of present alliance that the October Revolution brought us, is an important struggle in today's conditions, in a fight against this Modi government and its policy of dividing the country and destroying the social unity of our immense diversity that exists in our country. So that is why today the struggle against the policies of the Modi government, the economic policies that are creating greater misery and for the people and greater intensified exploitation, the policies of intensified communism, communal polarization that is dividing the unity of the people these two have to be fought against and defeated. If the work of President Alliance has to be strengthened, if the stage of the revolution, as we talked about earlier, that the October Revolution brought us, has to be properly implemented in India, and therefore this observing the October Revolution and understanding its contribution has a direct bearing on our struggles in today's age. And that is why today, this, it is imperative to defeat the Modi government, imperative to defeat this Modi government and to, to reverse these policies that this government is, uh, is employing and to force and build the unity of the exploited section for moving towards a revolutionary transformation in India. And these are both interlinked.
it's not merely some an, an electoral slogan or electoral task. It is a, 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 I mean, a task that is integrally interlinked with our entire conception of fighting against these economic policy, policies that are Indian spent exploitation, against this communal polarization that is disrupting the unity of the toiling people in the struggles for a revolutionary change, and the force that is doing both these things, the current government, that has to be removed from office so that we can strengthen the unity of the exploited classes and move towards a revolutionary transformation of India. That is the direct lesson that the October Revolution, whether it's Russia today and the Soviet Union exists or not, but this experience of the October Revolution continues to remain valid for us here. So the final, the fourth point is what? I said there are four important points of the revolution. What is the first point? October Revolution has demonstrated that the revolution cannot succeed not only by not being anti-imperialist, it has to be anti-imperialist, but also by the fourth point of building the global solidarity against imperialism, which is the essence of Marxism, working men of all countries unite. The meaning is what? That imperialism is a global system. And that is why the October Revolution expressed solidarity with India's struggle for freedom, with Vietnam's struggle for freedom, with the African countries' struggles for freedom, and helped all these freedom struggles to advance, which we discussed earlier. So that international solidarity today is important for us also, with, in connection with the current government we have in India. What is happening today in Venezuela? What imperialism is doing today in Syria? What it is doing in Iran, what the Israelis are doing to Palestinians, continue to do that today. All the fights and struggles that the people of these countries are doing against imperialism are part and parcel of our struggles against imperialism. We are all part of one global struggle. So solidarity with the people who are being exploited elsewhere in other countries is an important element that sustains the October Revolution in the uh, in the Soviet Union in the initial year and from that we should draw when our government today is pro imperialist to one of the one of the measures and methods in order to go to dislodge this government is also to build up this international into anti imperialist solidarity and that is why we need to express ourselves on the conditions of the toiling people in every other country who are fighting against imperialism and also fighting against their existing conditions. That is why today in Sri Lanka, what is there is a constitutional crisis, there is a new power equation that is emerging, that the people of Sri Lanka will decide, Sri Lankan Supreme Court will decide what will be the future and how their, their crisis can be handled that we cannot and should not interfere. But we can definitely express a solidarity with the with the, with the tyrants there in Sri Lanka who have not been yet delivered the promise of their autonomy under the 13th Amendment to the Sri Lankan Constitution that was promised. So we say whatever be the crisis that is there in Sri Lanka, but this promise of giving complete autonomy to the Tamil speaking regions in Sri Lanka, a commitment that is Sri Lanka has made to the international community, whichever be the government in Sri Lanka, this cannot be today diluted or disrupted. That has to be given and that sort of solidarity must be explained, we must express as part of the global anti and global movement of the working and the oppressed peoples in the world. So the fourth lesson that we have to draw is that in order to transform India also into a better India, a non-exploitative India, we have to be a socialist India. We will have to be dependent also on the solidarity of the international working class, the international oppressed sections who are fighting their own countries against imperialism in various ways, that we are all part of one family seeking the liberation of humanity. And that is the objective that the October Revolution set out for itself. And for that objective, this solidarity will have to be strengthened, which means to directly oppose the pro imperialist solidarity that the Modi government is showing today and the way in which it is behaving in the international affairs.
I am finally for it. If these phones are uh, a relevant point from the October Revolution are relevant for us in our struggles in India, we must realize that any advance of the revolution movement in India, the first obstacle in today's country that we will have to cross is the obstacle to remove the current government from office without which this revolution is not possible. We have discussed why it is necessary to reverse the economic policies that are intensifying exploitation of the people. We have discussed why it is necessary to defeat the politics of communal polarization that is disrupting the unity of the exploited classes in our country for the moving towards the social transformation, the work of the alliance, etc. <coughs> but in addition, the Modi government is also destroying the very constitutional, republican constitutional values of the Indian constitution, which defines India as a social, of the, as a secular democratic republic. All institutions today are under attack from the parliament, from the Supreme Court, the judiciary. Now it has come down to the authority, constitutional authority. There is a question mark on the EC's neutrality. The CBI, there was a midnight coup on the CBI. Now the CAG, the CAG has been uh, being questioned of saying that why it is delaying giving these reports. Every single constitutional authority in our country, the right to information, that is being amended in such a way that the basic right is being denied. All these constitutional authorities are being undermined. Why? Because the government need not be accountable. And why should they not be accountable? You see what is happening in the Rafael scam. You see what is happening in the loot of your money, my money, in the public sector banks through the loans taken by the corporates. And that is why today, when uh, corporate loans that reminded me of Mr. Richard Lech, but before that, uh, corporate loans, what is the amount? 12 lakh crores of rupees minimum is what has been taken as loans that is not coming back. And if you try to get it back, they leave India and go away. So, our, uh, I mean, whether it is Shemalaya or uh, Dhiram Modi or Lalit Modi, I, don't, I did not know there were so many Modi's in India. <laughs> Dhiram Modi, Lalit Modi, Narendra Modi, you know, we have all these Modi's. And then, then you have, uh, you know, all the other things, I mean, all those who know it. Open root of India is taking place. And if they have to be, they don't want to be accountable, they have a parliament session that's got it. No answer. Rafael, they say there is no, there is no scam, there is no money trail. There won't be a money trail because you have legalized political funding, corruption. You have legalized political corruption. You have introduced these electoral bonds. Anybody can go and buy the bonds from the bank. Nobody knows who got it. They can give it to any political party. Nobody knows which party got it. And the party can go and encash the bond. Nobody knows who is encash the bond. So this political funding has been completely, the corruption has been legalized. So in order to avoid the accountability of this group, they are undermining parliamentary institutions. So that is why the most important thing is also they want to change their mindset. Education system is completely being rerun. Vice Chancellor, RSS people, Research Body Chief, RSS people, Indian history is reduced to history of Hindu mythology. Prime Minister of India, what did he say? Ancient India, we made so much advance that our plastic surgery was so advanced that we created Ganesha that put a head of an elephant on a human body and created Ganesha, the God. And he said, Karna. Karna is a test tube baby. We were so advanced. We had technology for test tube babies to be given to So everything goes back to your mythology. Then we must remind them, the Prime Minister, also, please uh, go back to mythology. Remember in uh, Mahabharata, the Kauravas were hundred brothers, the Pandavas were five. And in the Kauravas of hundred brothers, how many brothers' names do you know? 
And that is the real meaning of 